Welcome to Lisi's News, Views, and To-Dos, where we interview legal marketing and legal industry professionals about what's going on in the world of legal, um, what's changing and what that impact is, and what should change and maybe is going to take longer than we'd like, and then their advice for our audience. Today, I am beyond thrilled to have on Jennifer Bankston, who's president of Bankston Marketing Solutions. Jen, thank you so much for being on with me today and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Robin. I appreciate it and I'm honored. Yes. Um, Jen is actually a friend of mine. We were connected through Samantha McKenna and have had the opportunity to work together a little bit here and there over the past year since being introduced. And she's somebody whose advice I deeply appreciate and I really um, appreciate her guidance and just all the great ideas that she has to, to set me on a path of doing lots of exciting things. So I'm thrilled to have her on to talk about those things today. Um, so Jen, you know how this works. Our first question, what is news with you? What's going on um, in your world right now? Well, um, in addition to being having been hunkered down, as one might say, over the past yeah. 13 to 14 months, um, it's enabled me to grow Bankston Marketing Solutions. So we have some exciting news regarding the company in the next few months. That said, what's really even newer is the launch of the Cairo Project uh, with two fellow legal marketers, Heather McCullough and Jill Hughes. And mm -hmm. the Cairo Project uh, was formed essentially out of the fact that millions of women have left the workforce during the pandemic. So we sat down and looked through and thought, how can we address some of the problems, uh, the systemic problems that are happening with women. Just last week, I saw that women apparently reach their financial peak at 43 or 44, as opposed to men, where it's 55. Hmm. So what could we do to bridge some of those gaps? And with some of those gaps, that requires leadership and leadership training. And so the Cairo Project, our goal is to balance leadership. And we want to do it in a way that's a little bit different. Many of us, um, including myself, have formed women's affinity groups over the years or women's initiatives. And we were given money. We were given some semblance of power, but men were not in the room hmm. or how um, there are many affinity groups as we know nowadays, LBGTQI. But, but the point being that others were not in the group um, to help to collaborate, serve as allies. Um, I usually like to use the term collaborator. If you're not an ally, are you an enemy? I mean, that's just a question. And yeah. so, so by bringing together pods where we have 12 people, eight women and four others, we can really start to have conversations and build training. And so mm -hmm. we're excited because we're about to launch a survey with ALM intelligence and with women in funds. And through that survey, we hope that we can help to define our program. And we have an amazing um, starter advisory board that's comprised of some legal marketers, uh, some general counsel, and some folks outside of industry who work in financial services, perhaps they've served as COOs or general counsel in, in financial services as a way to understand how can we create the, a better program. And our program will be um, a six month program, but we don't stop there. Mm. We're then going to really get rooted in data over the next few years and see the path forward and help shape the path forward for a lot of these uh, folks. That's so exciting. I remember the day that the Cairo project launched and I felt like it was something different that day, hearing, you know, reading the announcement, talking with you and Jill and Heather about it. I, it is, um, I think it's going to go very far because there's an absolute need for it. Um, there's a need for this training. And when you know how nerdy I am about data, and so <laughs> using that data to help shape the training and shape the future 
of the the project and the organization, et cetera, I think that's going to be so impactful. I'm I can't wait to see I can't wait to see the results of that survey in particular. <laughs> Yes, um, it was in, in speaking with a fair number of general counsel um, who are at, at companies, at institutional investors, they have said sort of the that, and this is for the legal marketers out there with their ear to the ground, um, <laughs> that when they issue RFPs, they're not issuing RFPs to receive platitudes. They want to know mm. concretely what, what the changes are that are really coming within the organization and um, within the law firms that are, are seeking to serve as panel counsel. So I think that's really, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. Well, okay. So then to, to follow on from that, um, and maybe this is a natural segue, what do you see changing in our industry? You know, we know our industry is slow to change and adapt, um, but what do you sort of see changing with your clients or maybe through your network? Sure. So as you know, I work with a fair number of law firms as well as technology-driven companies. And so as soon as the pandemic hit and things started, everyone started to shelter in place. The tech companies, of course, came forward and said, what can we do? What do we need to do? How do we pivot? And so a lot of the focus there was on working with them on their brand promise and talking through, let's take a step back. Let's take a step back and define your purpose. Mm -hmm. And I like to talk about purpose in terms of the individual every individual should have a purpose statement. Um, and I know that that's difficult because especially in, in legal marketing, we try to present things that are, that are short and pithy and the lawyers try to elongate things um, and put it into a, an entire page. They're therefore diluting the meaning, but yeah. a purpose statement is one to two sentences, if that. And so working with those tech companies to help them define their purpose, their brand promise and their pivot. And so I am now seeing that with my law firm clients and with other law firms where they're working toward how can they reevaluate what that promise is that they're offering to the environment. So law firms are, are a little bit slow to adapt, to adjust, to, to work toward that. For example, when I lived in, in Austin, Texas, and I worked for a tech company, our technology helped enable the first wearable um, uh, tech-enabled bikini. And so why do I mention that? And why is that important? <laughs> what does that mean? Why do you need a tech-enabled bikini? Well, because if you're out there um, in the water and, it's, and your body um, is getting too much sun, the, the wearable device goes off um, and tells you to apply more sunblock. Or mm. if you're with your family and your pet um, that maybe is in a tent or something goes outside the perimeter, um, it alerts you that your pet has escaped. Um, go find your pet. And so with, with legal, a lot of it, so with the tech clients, there was a lot of forecasting. What's going to change? With mm -hmm. legal, there was the same and that ran in tandem. And so I was very pleased to see that. But now as we look forward, what I would really like to see and what I'm starting to work with um, some of my clients on has to do with where are we headed in 2030? Mm. And so I would like to see more conversations around that because I gave you the wearable device as, as a fun example, but more so to show that where what does that mean for the changing face of law firms? What does that mean for the people that represent those companies or are seeking to represent those companies? What skills do the lawyers have to have? And what skills do, do the legal marketing team need to start to work toward to put forward those type of reports? And then mm -hmm. I would say this, the, the other thing that I'm really seeing is the doubling down on forming of that client experience and looking toward how can we as marketers uh, get our content in place and in an order in an exciting and meaningful way that's impactful, but, but also move forward. 
And the last thing probably to mention there is the humanity element. Um, and that would be the communications factor, um, mm -hmm. communi communicating with candor, but within our groups, creating those safe environments within our own organizations and communicating with candor where it's meaningful, meaningful within the organization so that the, the clients and prospects really understand where you're headed. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's Very quite, that's a little bit of a mouthful to, to dissect say, and, so and analyze <laughs> and assess to unpack. Um, but I just thought I would, yeah. There's so it's much a, I want to talk about in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, well, just on the, the last point, cause you and I recently had a conversation to this point, you know, creating the safe environment. And I'm sure you know this about me that I believe in, I won't call it radical candor, but I believe in Yes. speaking the truth. I believe in voicing my opinion respectfully and appropriately, but making sure that it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. I actually just had a conversation right before you and I got on this interview with one of my staff saying, you know, we have such a great opportunity being on the agency side because mm -hmm. whereas maybe in-house we may have felt handcuffed, whether that was real or, or perceived, we might've felt handcuffed from voicing that opinion. We are now on the agency side. We are being paid to show that we know what we're talking about. And so don't feel like you have to do it X way because we're taking over this process and that's how it was done before. We know that that process can be better. We know that this thing can be better. So let's tell them. And kind of in parallel to what you're talking about, about the client experience, um, I think I see parallels there, right? For the law right. firms to communicate candidly and openly um, with empathy and with humanity, but also show that they, they know what they're talking about. I think I could go on and on, sorry. Well, but no, it's, but, it's, but, it's, but it's, it's, it's true because it's, it's that while firms have been pursuing change during the pandemic and some have been modest and incremental process improvements, some yep. have been somewhat more dramatic changes to mission strategy or firm structure. But I cannot overemphasize that the leaders within law firms, even team leaders need transparent environments where mm. every stakeholder is not fearful and feels safe and empowered to share their ideas and communicate openly. Now, I know that being on the agency side, that's a little bit easier said than done, but what it requires is commitment from everyone. Because as you know, with radical candor, that breeds trust and accountability and cooperation, and it motivates team members to become more involved and take ownership, quite frankly. And mm -hmm. we're also in a time where health is an everyday preoccupation beyond anything we have seen. We're in a health ecosystem. And when I talk about a health ecosystem, I'm, I'm not just your physicality, but your, your mental health. Um, and that's very important to the lifestyle crisis that we're mm -hmm. currently in. It was before we went into the pandemic and it's certainly now, um, and it's endemic in law firms. So much so. I, I've talked with many people about, you know, you're, you don't have that two hour commute each way every day. What does that time look like in your life now? This is sort of a tangent, I apologize, but you know, what does that time look like in your life now? Is that, are you finding ways to fill that with meaningful self-care, exercise, whatever you need, um, because that is, that is time you've been able to reclaim or are you finding ways to stuff it with more work, you know? And I've talked with a lot of friends and been very open about my own burnout because I've been stuffing that time, that time I might've been commuting with more work um, yes. just because we're really busy, but now I'm trying to create more of that space for myself. Um, anyway, this again, tangent, I apologize and take it off. No, <laughs> I, I completely, I completely agree with you. What I have found is that people who are in-house legal marketers are telling me that they've been cramming that time with more work. Yes. And now maybe, maybe a few months ago um, at the beginning of the year when 2021 was just supposed to be this magic one, two, three snap. And of course it's not, yeah. it's, it's the, it's a bit of a continuation. 
um, folks have really tried. Um, for myself personally, I had initially stuffed it with more work. Then I said, no, um, if I am going to write, I want to do my own writing. Um, some of the things that I enjoy uh, writing about and topics, or um, I've found a new passion in kettlebells, for example, and you know, just, uh, just something different just for the, the, the clarity or taking a walk. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> I live in Louisiana, so I did try kayaking, but I fell in the lake and I was a little nervous about the, about the gators coming up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> yes. don't no, do that. Not a good idea. <laughs> Well, so that leads me to my, my third question. Um, and I think we've touched on this a little bit, but you know, what should be changing, but it's taking, is probably going to take longer than it should. Um, you know, you mentioned mm -hmm. thinking about the law firm of 2030. And I love that because yes. I, I've been saying similar things in terms of LMA. I don't want to talk about the way the LMA of 2021, I want to talk about the LMA of 2025 and 2030. So what are those yes. changes that probably should be happening and we should start taking root now, but maybe it will take longer. Sure. So as we know, the companies and organizations that law firms work for are, have already focused on experience-led purpose. And what do I mean by that? That's the whole CSR and, and where that fits in, in terms of identifying the purpose too. Yeah. But it's also honing in on EQ to understand behavior because the workforce of 2030 will be comprised of more individual contractors. And so how are we focusing on their emotional intelligence, Robin? How are we ready to draw on your favorite big data? And then, but there's also a concept or notion of what's known as thick data. And those are your deep insights on people and then how do you align those insights on people with market trends, which is the overarching data. And so law firms can and should be implementing those type of trends as they're, as they're filtering through their own data, right? Because we, we know that law firms in the past five years have embraced ways to get their systems to talk to one another, ways to understand these data, this data. But the, the data of people and their behaviors is something that I believe that they need to catch up a little bit mm. on because it's a little bit more, I don't want to call it squishy, but it's just a little bit more of a, of a forward thinking notion. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's how do you prepare your people for skills that they don't necessarily need today but they will need in 2030 that management consulting is so great at doing and great at presenting and great at offering right now. And that's what I would say. Yeah. It is such a good point. Um, because I think we as people have a tendency to think of things in definites, in absolutes. Um, you know, all people, in this category feel this way about this thing and all people in that category feel the opposite way or whatever the case may be and i don't think i'm oversimplifying that i myself suffer from that sometimes where i think about a situation and i assume everybody thinks about it the same way i do or whatever mm -hmm. and to your point that that thick data which is a new term you've taught me today <laughs> um and understanding how of the hundred people in that group you could still potentially have maybe a hundred different viewpoints on how to tackle a situation and how to find similarities and commonalities to help people address a solution or a challenge in the way that they can achieve their greatest success, as opposed to forcing them to fit into that box or that, you know, specific concept. Yes. But there's I think also, that but is, the, yeah, yeah. And no, there's also, yeah, the pat I was going to say, there's also the pattern of, right, where we're seeing people leave cities. Mm -hmm. um, moving trucks pulling up um, in my native New York and they're moving down to Florida. What does that mean for how are the legal marketers, how are, how are those folks performing some level of market research to assess and analyze what the needs will be for their law firm? It's not encouraging them to open up a satellite office per se in West Palm Beach. It's more explaining that what will 
what are some of those factors and, and patterns and what will things look like in the next four years, five years? Mm. Um, or supply chain, right? We would have, we would have all thought that um, we would have had to open a uh, hundred more toilet paper factories, right? Last year, and now you know we've seen that, right? So now that that has, well, somewhat. I'm, I'm sure people are still hoarding, but my point being that, what does that mean in terms of what people want? What goods will they consume? What does that mean for a practice and how you apply that? So. There's a lot of a lot of mapping you can do and, and storytelling around some of those things. It'll be interesting to see. We often talk about generational differences um, if, in any industry, but just in the legal industry in particular. Um, it'll be interesting to see the res receptivity of people who've been in legal for 40-ish years, let's say, to some of these concepts, because I think it will come more naturally to millennials, Gen Z, whatever the generation names are, <laughs> than it will. I just think it's like, a, it's a it's a shift in the way we think about society that is, you know, pervasive in business and in human interaction, et cetera, um, that it is gonna be much more naturally adapted to by generations coming up than it will be I mean, I'm not saying anything revolutionary, but wow. I think this in particular will really feel like a stark, a stark difference, don't you think? I think that and it's interesting what you just said because I just did a calculation in my head while we while you were talking. I believe this class that graduates from law school this year will be the last millennial class, mm. and so now we've moved. We'll be moving to Gen Z, and we'll be moving. We'll be transitioning from millennial to Gen Z during the pandemic. And what has mm. that done to people and their norms and their behavior and how they onboard? Some of our largest law firms have, they're still operating remotely. Will that continue? Are they shedding space? Are they downsizing? Or so there, there's a lot of what ifs and unknowns. And yeah. has, you know, has a first year um, has a first year's experience uh, from the class of 2020 been entirely on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Has that person been able to take a, take a deposition <laughs> yet? And if that person has, what does that look like? Or what does that look like for that person? Uh, for a legal marketer who has maybe onboarded um, during the pandemic, because some have, have if they've never met their team <laughs> in person, um, how will that shape us for the next five years? And what are some of the things that we can do to help them? So I know I'm asking questions rather than presenting answers, but I do think that it's, that it's things that when we're not working on the, the 100 tasks plus the forward thinking actions, um, we, we could be addressing in the legal marketing community. And you know what, as you were talking, I just thought of something. We always talk about how, you know, lawyers don't learn the business of law in law school. And some of the points you were just making, if we have less centralized operations and, you know, just some of the natural consequences of the way business is shifting and the legal mm -hmm. profession is shifting, will that necessitate lawyers to be more facile with the, that knowledge, you know? I mean, because... Right. I don't, it wouldn't even begin to predict what that might, what might be the reason for that. But I wonder, I, I just wonder if that might be something, you know, if you're a lawyer working from whatever location, but your home office is technically New York, even if you're in, mm -hmm. I don't know, Kansas mm -hmm. City, for goodness sakes, um, are there just going to be some things, of course, technology facilitates a lot of communication much more quickly and everything in the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. But are you going to have to know as a lawyer in Kansas City how those business operations work because you don't have a legal assistant sitting outside of your door? You know, even something as simple right. as that, you're just going to have to understand how that process works. And also couple that with, here's where I get nerdy, couple that with the fact that we have a gener generations coming up in the profession that are not accustomed to having a dedicated legal assistant that are yes. more accustomed to being able to manage their calendar independently for, as a silly example, you know, right. That'll be, we should really, you know, bookmark this conversation in five or 10 years in the future, come back to it and see how that shifted. Cause I bet you that it's going to be one of those things that nobody's 
like focusing on. I don't think anybody needs to set, study it, but I, I bet you that that is probably going to happen, you know? Yes. I wouldn't, I would not be surprised. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well so my last question, I always like to ask our audience for their advice. Um, or should I say my audience? I always like to ask my interviewee for their advice for our <laughs> audience. Um, you know, you are a font of wisdom. So I, I know that your advice is going to be really, it's really going to resonate with our audience. So I'd love to hear what you have to share. Sure. So my favorite quote is from the poet Audre Lorde. And she, and I used to have it, um, used to have her entire poem stations um, up on the wall behind me. Now I have a, can't quite see it, but it's, um, it's an image of a Lafitte's uh, blacksmith shop in, um, in New Orleans. But there's, there's a stanza in Stations where Audra says, and I may, I may not quite get it exactly right, but um, some women wait for themselves around the next corner and call the empty spot peace. Some women wait for something to change and nothing does change. So they change themselves. And what I mean by that, because it's not applicable to only women is I generally like to call several people a week, um, two to three people, and see if, I, if we can collectively share wisdom. I can offer advice on something I've seen that they've done and maybe make a suggestion, or I hadn't heard from them for a while, so I would like for um, to understand why. Have they been so busy that that mental wellspring is just is just shut down, and that then that's a pause for concern, uh, and and just figure that out. But when I have my own set of questions, sometimes I hesitate because sometimes I'm trying to problem solve something, and I'm. I'm hesitant to go to someone. And what I have found during the pandemic is I now do. I go to people, I seek, regularly seek them out to ask them something to help me to overcome a certain challenge that I'm facing. And when people are seeking mentors, remember that the mentor-mentee relationship is very fragile because it relies on the mentee being able to reach out from time to time and say, here's what I need or here's what I think I need. Um, for some of the younger people um, that I mentor, and when I say younger, I'm, I'm talking about people who are just maybe a few years out of, out of college or graduate school or a vocational school. Sometimes they say, well, I read Simon Sinek and I just, I don't understand, you know, I, I, I still can't find my why. And, it, and it's, it's not about necessarily finding your why today, but it is about setting goals, right? You might not know where exactly you want to be in five years or 10 years, um, the cliche type questions, but you need to set small goals. Okay, over the next three months, I would like to explore thick data. How do I get there? What is, what is my goal around that? What is my why? What is my how? Mm -hmm. And, oh, by the way, Jen, is it okay if we talk once every three weeks or something just to see if I'm on track for 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. Of course. And if someone says no, well, then they're not truly your mentor. Um, people are busy, but busy is not a badge of courage. Um, busy is, is being able to, to find ways to, to work on that type of relationship. So just like... Yeah. Right, just like we have to, uh, if I stop using my kettlebells for a week, I, I feel it. Um, then instead of the 40 pound kettlebell, I have to go back to the 25 pound kettlebell. So it, it's yeah. the same kind of thing about exercising um, your mind and changing your mindset. And so I hope that helps the audience just to think through that, have, have something specific that you want to ask or seek and, and work that. through it and then, and then work on it. Um, because your, your, your mentor, your friend, or your colleague um, can be your best advocate and help you along. Oh, you know what? I didn't get to that, but okay, instead of working on this project, I'm, I am going to spend one hour on it this week or instead of doing something else. And I know that's easier said than done. Yeah, but I have found personally in the pandemic in particular that that 
giving of time, whatever I can reasonably give has been the most fulfilling activity. You know, there was a, a few articles, I don't know, a year ago about flow, right? The being able to have a, a process that you can completely dedicate your mind and attention to from start to finish. And that we were all missing that because of the, you know, <laughs> numerous distractions and where I found flow aside from cooking, but where I found nice. flow was <laughs> in having the exact conversations that you're talking about. Um, and I'm uh, on the mentee side as a mentee I struggle with asking for the help and the guidance you know and, and reaching out exactly as you said um but I'm trying to cultivate that better but on the <laughs> mentor side you know sitting down and even just having a 30-minute conversation beginning middle and end and working through that problem and identifying those issues that has been it has been satisfying in terms of having flow, but also fulfilling in terms of, of helping somebody. And I hope that that is one of the biggest, um, I don't know what the right word is, but one of the best things to come out of this pandemic, because I, I don't think that you and I are alone. I think a lot of people have said, how do I connect with people again? How do I give some time and energy? Because you know, being isolated in my home, I have to find a way to connect meaningfully with other human beings. And I know a lot of people who are doing something in this vein. So I hope that lasts after, after the pandemic. And I hope people take your advice because I think it's, as I said, very wise. And so I really appreciate you sharing it. Of course, thank you. And I appreciate your, both your friendship and your um, advice as well. It's, uh, it's great to be able to collaborate with people across our industry. I think the legal marketing industry is unique in that way. There are always people willing to share, offer pearls of wisdom, um, calm you down off the ladder, so to speak, when there's a certain project that perhaps you're trying to have a conversation with the lawyers that ultimately have to approve it. And you feel like it's a very different conversation than you've had with other legal marketers. So, yeah. yes. Yeah, Definitely. I totally agree. Well, thank you so, so Bye. much for being on today. This was such a great conversation, um, as we said earlier, with lots of information in it. And I know our audience will find it very, very valuable. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Robin. Take care. Thanks, you too. All right, bye.